Good evening to you all. Uh, I'm pleased to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker, Sara, Fe Sara Ferris. She is a senior lecturer in sociology at Goldsmiths College in London. She works on sociological and political theory, race, racism and feminism, migration and gender, with a particular focus on migrant women and their role in, within social reproduction. In tonight's lecture, Sara will deal with some of the topics she has been working on in her book, In the Name of Women's Rights, The Rise of Female Nationalism in which she researches the common practice of anti-Islamic and, and xenophobic initiatives exploiting feminist ideas. She introduces the term female nationalism in order to describe practices and advocacy campaigns which, by showing the Muslim men as oppressors, emphasize the need to rescue Muslim women. This anti-Islamic groups is gender equality to legitimate the their pre prejud prejudices, or as simply put, their co-opting feminism. The very important aspect of Sarah's work, I would say, is the fact that she introduces a political economic perspective into the mostly culturalist debate on Islamophobia. She reveals broad material interests and economic calculations behind convergences of different political projects such as neoliberalism, feminism, and far-right parties. So let's hear about it. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for having me. Today, thanks Carolina Herga from the Center for Women's Studies for the invitation. It's my first time in Zagreb, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, yeah, I thought today I would begin by telling you a little bit what prompted me to write this book in the first place. You see the cover of the book here, which I always include in the slides because I think it's great. I didn't choose it. It's the editor's choice, but I think it's very... It's, um, I think it's a powerful image that uh, covers some important meanings about what this book is about. So um, I decided to, to, to write this book. It was back in 2011 when I was living in Germany. And with some colleagues, uh, we organized a conference on the mobilization of feminist ideas by the right wing. Um, it was uh, just a few years after Jasbir Puar had published her book on homonationalism, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. And the concept that she introduced, homonationalism, um, opened up a very important conversation, I think, on the left and for Marxist feminists, socialist feminists, on the various ways in which uh, feminist ideas and also uh, gay rights, LGBTQ rights, uh, were increasingly instrumentalized by the right wing. So also, um, I would say, was influenced by the work of, of Pua, in particular, I thought it was quite powerful, this new concept that she introduced. And that's also how I, I began to work and to, to think about this concept. Although, obviously, this work builds on many years of work, especially as Marta was saying, on migrant women in Europe and the role migrant women have in the social reproductive sphere in, in Europe. But um, this book so began, especially in order to answer the question, how is it possible that uh, ideas of women's rights, which are progressive ideas, uh, uh, usually associated with the left, uh, are instrumentalized by the right wing? How is it possible that we buy, that people are buying into uh, this instrumentalization? I want to give you some examples of what I mean when I talk about these instrumentalizations. So the first example is a poster from Italy. This was used by the right-wing party, the Northern League, in 2000, it was at the end of the 2000, 2006, 2007, and it was after there was a huge uh, discussion about the possibility of Turkey entering the European Union. You might remember, it was many years ago. But on that occasion, the Northern League, which as you probably know now is a uh, one of the, the probably the most um, powerful party, it became the most powerful party in, in Italian politics in the last few years. 
So on that occasion, the Northern League decided to campaign against the entrance of Turkey in, in the European Union, basically by saying, if we allow the entrance of a, a country with a majoritarian Muslim population into the European Union, this is what will happen also to European or to Italian women. They will be turned into basically um, veiled women behind cages. The second example is Marine Le Pen. Again, we are not talking about small right-wing parties, but about leading right-wing parties in their own countries, who in 2016, so more recently, she commented on the so-called refugees and migration crisis by saying that that crisis also somehow could, could, be, could signal the end of women's rights in Europe. And the last example I want to show you is, uh, again, from Italy. Uh, again, this is an image which is, uh, which is taken from a website which is called All, um, All Migrants' Crimes. So it's a website that's been initiated by the Northern League in Italy. And basically, it is dedicated to list all the crimes committed by migrants. And when you look at the list of crimes, the majority are uh, sexual crimes, so rapes, uh, rape and sexual assault. And what's interesting here is that, again, the reason why this Italian woman uh, is obviously being subjected to violence, apparently her problem is that she's married to a, a Muslim man, Ahmed, a, a, a clearly Arab-sounding man. So all these examples, I just brought these examples because I think they are quite powerful reminders of the visual ways in which the right wing uh, is increasingly using this idea of women's rights, particularly against Muslims and against Muslim men, but as I want to argue, not only against Muslim men, but against non-Western, non-white uh, migrant men more generally. So as someone who has worked for several years on issues of female migration and especially stereotypes and representations of migrant and Muslim women in Europe, I was very interested in all these questions. How, as I said, how is it possible that these instrumentalizations are taking place and people are believing that? And um, and so I was especially interested in understanding the so-called rescue narratives that right-wingers, but also neoliberals, and some feminists, I will say, were using when addressing Muslim and migrant communities and claiming that these women needed to be emancipated from their backward cultures. But also, I was somehow not entirely satisfied with the answers that were provided by previous studies. In particular, as someone, who, as I said, who belongs to the strand of feminism that is Marxist and social reproduction feminism, I was interested to see whether we could identify a political economic logic behind these so-called rescue narratives. And I wanted to explore whether the sudden stigmatization of Muslim and the migrant men in the name of women's rights had also something to do with the position of Muslim and migrant women in the economic arena. So I began to look into these issues and worked on a project that eventually, as I said, developed into this book. So in the time that I have left, I would like to tell you something of some of the main arguments that I present um, in my book. So first of all, this book analyzes what I call the convergence on anti-Islam politics among three very different political agendas, right-wing nationalists, some feminists and femocrats, and I will explain this term, and neoliberal policies. And I analyze these convergences in three countries that have shown important similarities in the ways in which this convergence convergence has taken place. That is France, the Netherlands, and Italy. So from Gert Wilders in the Netherlands, uh, you might be familiar with his name, he's also the leader of one of the biggest right-wing parties in the Netherlands, the Party for Freedom. From Gert Wilders to Marine Le Pen in France and Matteo Salvini in Italy, 
One of the central tropes mobilized by these right-wing nationalists is the profound danger Muslim males constitute for Western European societies, due, above all, to their oppressive treatment of women. On the other side of the political spectrum, some well-known and outspoken feminists have also joined the anti-Islam chuar. Throughout the 2000s, internationally renowned French feminist philosopher Elisabeth Badinter, Dutch feminist politician Ayan Irshi Ali, and the famous Italian occasional feminist Oriana Fallaci, she was feminist only when it suited her, so they all, all have denounced Muslim communities as especially, especially and exceptionally sexist, contrasting them to Western countries as a sites of superior gender relations. Similarly, women's organizations, as well as top-ranking bureaucrats in state gender equality agencies, often termed femocrats, they all singled out Islamic religious practices as especially patriarchal, arguing that they had no place in the Western public sphere. Accordingly, these feminists as well have all endorsed legal proposals, such as veil bans, while portraying Muslim women as passive victims who need to be rescued and emancipated. This heterogeneous anti-Islam feminist front, therefore, presents a sexism and patriarchy as the almost exclusive domain of the Muslim other. And here again, I want to give you a little example. This is uh, Elisabeth Badinter, who is one of the most uh, prominent uh, feminists endorsing anti-Islam arguments. So she's a very famous um, French feminist philosopher. And this is what she said. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole quote. You can read it. It's quite short. Basically, she's saying uh, these uh, women who wear a burqa, uh, they are pathological. Uh, they are sick, mentally sick, and we need to defend themselves, uh, sorry, we need to defend ourselves as Westerners, as Europeans, from these pathologies. And she said that when she was, um, basically she was interviewed in 2010 uh, as an expert, as an expert advisor, when the government was deciding about the possibility of applying the full, the full uh, ban on the full veil, like the burqa. So this is again an example that I want to show because the language she uses is, is quite violent. But she's not isolated, she's not an exceptional case. There are many um, feminists in these countries, in France, in Italy and the Netherlands, but also in other European countries, and also non-European countries, who are increasingly using this quite strong language against uh, Muslim communities in particular, in order to say, uh, this, there is us here and it is them on the other side, and they are the enemies and we need to identify them as such. So the peculiar encounter between anti-Islam agendas and the emancipatory rhetoric of women's rights is not, however, restricted to the nationalists, and the slides I showed you before on right-wing parties are quite telling, but also the feminists. Also, neoliberal advocates who are otherwise, or they claim to be otherwise anti-nationalist, have also increasingly deployed anti-Islam representations in the name of women's rights. A good example of these are the so-called civic integration programs for migrants, which are, as I will explain a little bit more later, a landmark of neoliberalism. So these uh, civic integration programs, uh, which uh, in a nutshell are those programs that have been designed in order to integrate migrants in the European countries by asking them to learn the language and the values and the history and the civic values uh, of Europe. So these programs have made migrants long-term residency dependent upon a certified commitment 
fundamentally to become like Europeans, as I said, by learning the language and history and values of the European countries that host uh, uh, them. So these policies are urging migrants both to acknowledge women's rights as a central value of the West and to assimilate to Western cultural practices which are presented as more civilizationally advanced. So this, again, is a little example from... Um, just to, I just want to give you a little example of what I'm talking about. This is uh, the page, uh, it's all in French, from a leaflet that the French state has prepared for migrants. At least it used this, uh, this little leaflet until uh, um, five years ago. So basically, in th these leaflets are given to migrants in order to tell them what they need to learn about the French society if they want to be integrated. So it's not just about learning French, but it's also about learning the values of French society. And according to, to the French state, uh, in order to integrate, migrants need especially to acknowledge equality between men and women, women's rights. Now this, you might say, is not a problem in itself. It's always good to remind people about women's rights, of course. The problem, and I will, tell you, I, I will give you more examples a little bit later, the problem starts when you see, for instance, the ways in which this message is delivered. And also when you see the ways in which uh, uh, all these messages have as a presupposition uh, the idea that these migrants don't know anything about women's rights. The, so this message is delivered as if these men, but also women, somehow do not respect each other. So there is a strong uh, Eurocentric and racist assumption uh, according to which these migrants need to be taught women's rights because otherwise uh, they have no clue about what feminism or these rights are. So in light of all of this, now I try to give you some uh, examples of right-wing, uh, the, the ways in which right-wing parties are instrumentalizing women's rights, uh, the ways in which some feminists uh, are using women's rights against the Muslims, and also the ways in which neoliberal policies such as this, uh, this is just an example from a neoliberal document, uh, are instrumentalizing uh, women's rights. So in light of all of these, the, the, the question that I really explore in this book is, or the questions are, why are these different movements involving the same trope and identifying Muslim men as one of the most dangerous threats to Western societies? Are we witnessing the rise of a new unholy alliance, or is this seeming consensus among uh, across the political spectrum, merely coincidental and uh, contingent. And finally, why are Muslim women being presented with offers of emancipation and rescue in a context of rising Islamophobia and anti-immigration sentiments, particularly regarding employment and welfare? So why are especially women singled out as those who somehow are enemies but not entirely enemies? How is it possible it's, that they claim that it's possible to save and rescue them. So in order to answer these questions and to frame the political economic logic underpinning this unexpected convergence among these different political agendas that I told you a little bit about, I have coined this term female nationalism. So female nationalism, I want to give you the definition here, is short for feminist and femocratic nationalism. And it refers both to the exploitation of feminist themes by nationalists and neoliberals in anti-Islam, but as I will show, also anti-immigration campaigns, and to the participation of certain feminists and femocrats in the stigmatization of Muslim men under the banner of gender equality. Female nationalism thus describes, on the one hand, the attempts of Western European right-wing parties and neoliberals to advance xenophobic and racist politics through the touting of gender equality, while on the other hand, it captures the involvement of various well-known and quite visible feminists and femocrats in the current framing of Islam as a quintessentially misogynistic religion and culture. 
So in this presentation, I want to suggest that female nationalism must be understood as an ideology that springs from a specific mode of encounter, or as I prefer to call it, a convergence, amongst different political projects, and that is produced by and productive of a specifically economic logic. The next part of this paper is thus devoted to clarifying one key dimension of female nationalism. I will focus, and I'm not going to speak at length about why I speak of a female nationalism as a convergence. Maybe if someone asks me, I will say a little bit more about this. Um, but I want to focus particularly on why I say that female nationalism needs to be understood also as a form of neoliberal political economy. So as I told you at the beginning of this presentation, there are very few studies. Uh, as I said, uh, I was not very satisfied with uh, some of the analysis of this phenomena because I felt they were mostly focusing upon the cultural aspects or the political aspects, but there was no match on the more economic dimensions. So there are very few studies that have tried to explore the political economic foundations of what I call these um, uh, ideological convergences. So the few studies that have attempted to take into account these political economic dimensions, especially of the turn to gender and, and gay equality by conservative neoliberal or racist politics, have referred mainly to neoliberalism as a type of background force. For example, Sirma Bilge, who is a Canadian feminist who has worked especially on intersectionality, and she did a study of what she calls the sexual nationalism in Quebec and in Canada. So Sirma Bilge maintains that the possibility for gender and sexuality to become the operation field of racist and imperialist nationalisms is mainly due to their fittingness with the neoliberal mode of hiding structural inequalities behind cultural conflicts. So basically, um, there is this study by Sirma Bilge, but there are also other studies, for instance, by Paul Mepsham in, uh, in the Netherlands, that try to say that uh, um, there is so much, there are these convergences now between neoliberalism, for instance, and gay rights, because neoliberalism tries not to talk much about uh, structural problems, but everything be uh, is uh, kind of diluted into more cultural problems, and therefore it's easier to talk about, for instance, or even to endorse gay rights, just in order to avoid talking about poverty, structural inequalities, social class, etc. Now, um, I think there is some truth to this. I think I'm not saying that these studies are wrong. I think they actually, um, I think they they grasp an important element of these uh, the, the way in which neoliberalism functions. Uh, but these studies, in my view, and I have a slide here, because sometimes I, I use a slide when I think, uh, I, I, when I try to highlight a concept, so bear with me on this. So these studies, I think, they treat neoliberalism as the kind of economic theater of operation for the encounter between this different array of forces, but not as one of the main characters on stage. So while I agree that neoliberalism is central for understanding all these phenomena, I argue that neoliberalism is not simply the contextual ground on which the female nationalist convergence takes place, but it is itself constitutive of such a convergence. And I will try to explain what I mean by this. So the chief example here, again, is those civic integration policies that I was telling you a little bit about earlier. So um, these policies, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them, I don't, I don't know if you have them uh, here in Croatia, but they are becoming increasingly widespread uh, all across the European uh, Union. Not in all countries, but now they are being adopted by, by many countries. So basically now increasingly integration policies and immigration policies are becoming coincident, which means that in many countries, if you as a migrant want to have your visa renewed, you need to demonstrate that you can speak the language of the country, that you're looking for a job, 
that you know the history of the country. And all of this knowledge needs to be testified and certified. So you have to pass tests, you have to give documents to the state, state agencies, and so forth. So these are very, very important policies. They play an incredible role in, on the lives of new migrants now. So these policies, uh, in, in my, what I studied when I, when I was trying to, to, to look specifically into these policies, I really became aware that these policies are extremely important, both because they bear witness to the participation of neoliberalism in the stigmatization of Muslim and immigrants in the name of women's rights, but also because they are a powerful reminder that female nationalism is not just a discourse, it's not just a free-floating idea according to which Marine Le Pen or Gerd Wilders or Matteo Salvini can say sometimes in a you know, journalist interview, oh, of course we care about women's rights, but then nothing emerges out of that. That doesn't mean anything concretely. Actually, this uh, integration policies are a powerful reminder that female nationalism is actually increasingly institutionalized, which means that's been translated into very concrete policies. So we're not talking just about rhetoric, political rhetoric, or things that politicians say. We are talking also about things politicians and neoliberals are doing to the lives of migrant uh, women and, and men because it's uh, with these policies that these migrants can actually have the right to stay in the country of destination. Now, as I told you, how is femonationism central to these policies? Um, as I said, uh, in, in, the, in the French case, for example, but this is the same also in, in the Dutch and the Italian case and in other cases in Europe, in all these policies, uh, migrants are increasingly told, if you want to stay in this country, you have to, um, to learn that women are equal to men and that it's important to respect women's rights. So um, this has been done in different ways. Just to give you a little example, which was very famous a few years ago in the Netherlands, uh, in order to tell migrants uh, that uh, women's rights are so important, uh, the Dutch state, <coughs> excuse me, they made a video that was sent to all new migrants also abroad. This is a, a long story, but basically in some countries uh, they, there is also the integration abroad um, program, which means that migrants need to be integrated before they enter the country. They need to pass a test, language test and civic integration test, even before they enter the country. So anyway, in this video, um, basically there were scenes of uh, uh, women sunbathing topless, uh, and the idea was uh, Basically, it was meant as a provocation to Muslims in particular, in order to say, if you want to come to the Netherlands, you need to accept that here women have their rights and they can also go naked on, on, uh, uh, in, you know, on the street or on the beach. Uh, or there were other scenes uh, uh, in this video in which uh, there were men in the kitchen, uh, like wearing an apron and cooking. And uh, there were sentences like, uh, oh, if you want to come to this country, you need to learn that here men also cook meals. Uh, so this is not just a women's job, as if uh, these migrants didn't know anything about cooking and you, they all thought that it was women's job. So just to say, these videos, obviously, they had these incredibly strong and racist assumptions about uh, migrants cultures and also very orientalist assumptions thinking somehow that all these non-western migrants coming from Maghreb or from Asia but they all shared this very unique feature which was misogyny as if misogyny unified all these uh, all these migrants what i want to say though is that uh, um, the civic integration programs and the gender dimensions of the civic integration programs are not limited to these very, if you want, silly documentaries and videos, which are silly but very, you know, powerful in so many ways, and uh, somehow confined to the cultural um, dimensions, if you like. I think it's important also to acknowledge 
uh, that these documents have a very, very strong economic dimension. And this is what I try to focus on uh, in this book. So basically, I'll try to tell you the story a little bit briefly here. So in, uh, in 2007, the European Union established the so-called European Integration Fund, which is a big pot of money, uh, which is uh, devoted only to initiatives across Europe to uh, help migrants to integrate. So basically, every year, associations, organizations all across Europe, they can apply for fund from this European Integration Fund in order to uh, carry out uh, integration initiatives. And th they can be different types of initiatives. Uh, they can be about, uh, uh, for instance, organizations usually apply asking money in order to run language courses. This is one of the most common. But what's interesting is that increasingly, since 2011, so think also about the frame, it just uh, uh, I, immediately after or just towards the end the tail of the financial crisis, of the global financial crisis, um, the European Integration Fund is increasingly giving money to initiatives for economic integration. So the idea is that uh, uh, these organizations need to demonstrate that they are doing something in order to help migrants to find a job. Now, what's, uh, uh, if you want, the neoliberal dimension of uh, uh, these uh, um, economic integration programs uh, is that this is classical warfare, because the idea is uh, uh, these migrants uh, need to demonstrate that they find a job because uh, one of the uh, targets of the European Union, the so-called Europe 2020 agenda, is to have the 75% of the population in employment by 2020. And this also uh, in the case of migrants. But if you read all these European documents uh, uh, on uh, um, economic, on uh, uh, population's employment and also migration employment, uh, there is a certain obsession with the uh, employment of women. Uh, obviously, within this document, uh, women's employment is presented as a, as a target uh, in a progressive way because uh, the statistics that they use show that uh, migrant women in particular and Muslim women even more uh, in the population of migrant and, and ethnic minority women tend to have lower employment rates when they are compared to migrant and Muslim men. So according to the civic integration programs, it's very important to employ, to help these women to find a job, not only because they need to be productive and so contribute to the GDP of each country, according to these documents, but also because they say this will help these women to integrate and to emancipate so the idea is these women are not really working, probably because their husbands or their fathers or their male relatives, they don't want them to work because obviously these are backward cultures according to these documents. And so we need to help them to emancipate by um, helping them to find a job. So what is actually very interesting, when you look at what I did in this book is, uh, uh, I mean, in the work that was leading to, the, to this book, uh, I looked into these various um, initiatives and organizations who took money to help these women to find jobs. And what is particularly interesting, just to give you a little example, in the Netherlands, uh, there were organizations that were asking Muslim women, not necessarily migrant women, but Muslim women in particular, to volunteer, so to do volunteer work uh, in order to demonstrate they wanted actually to find a job and they were willing to do it for free in order to um, actually uh, become more emancipated. And it was interesting that, uh, well, I remember there were some interviews uh, with some of these uh, Muslim women in these Dutch cities. They were saying, uh, uh, wait a second, I already do this work at home. I take care of uh, my children for free and uh, I do all of these things for free at home. So why do I need to do it also for free outside home? And this is in the name of emancipation. So it was actually quite interesting, the absolutely uh, obvious reaction uh, of, of these women. 
And this is already leading me to the next bit I wanted to say, <coughs> which is that when you look in the end at what the kind of jobs that these uh, uh, economic integration programs were especially implementing, they are all jobs in the same branch of the economy. They are all jobs uh, as nannies, uh, as elderly carers, babysitters, uh, hotel cleaners. Uh, so all these migrant women, basically, they are asked to become economically emancipated and to be economically integrated by becoming basically the babysitters and the, and the, and the nannies of Europeans. So what I try to uh, really question in this book is, uh, is this emancipation? So how is it possible that the feminist movement fought in Europe, fought against the segregation of women within certain gender roles and against the segregation of women uh, as uh, uh, mothers, uh, babysitters, uh, social reproducers, uh, more generally. But then, this seems to be the destiny of Muslim and of migrant women. And this all in the name of rescuing them and uh, emancipating them. So, um, uh, this is really the, the, one of the most important contradictions that I try to highlight in the book, because what is also very interesting is that many of the organizations that are actually uh, taking the money uh, from the European Integration Fund in order to run these economic integration programs are women's organizations. So we are talking about many women's organizations who uh, are in fact using this money to help these women to become nannies, babysitters, uh, hotel cleaners, and so forth. So I would say there is at least, uh, um, I'll show you just have a little, um, this is just an example, I'm not going, well, maybe I'll tell you this example, but it just repeats what I said basically already. This is from Italy, and uh, this is a social worker working from uh, one of these organizations, which is called Nosotras, um, it's um, the Spanish for um, us, uh, basically. And it's interesting, this is a very actually uh, progressive uh, women's organization, which is, uh, was constituted 20 years ago by Italian and migrant women together. So they came together to fight for migrant women's rights. So we are talking about a very progressive uh, women's organization. At the same time, though, this organization, they, they got lots of money from the European Integration Fund in order to run these economic integration programs in Italy, especially in the Bologna area. And uh, uh, this is just uh, um, uh, a testimony for one of these women who says, yes, my job is uh, to accompany, to go with migrant women to job interviews. So this is the way I help. Sometimes I have to uh, do translations for them, but more in general, I just help them with a the job interview, doing the CV, etc. And she says, the majority of times, like 99% of times, these are all job interviews for, uh, for jobs such as nanny, elderly carer. So this is what I do. I take these women to become basically exploited, uh, uh, highly exploited uh, social reproductive workers within Italian families. And uh, um, yeah, this is basically just what I already told you, which I think it's a huge contradiction when feminists and femocrats urge emancipation for Muslim and non-Western migrant women while channeling them towards the very sphere from which the feminist movement had historically tried to liberate women. But now it is important here to mention also the active role of right-wing governments and of some nationalist right-wing parties in directing these women into the care and domestic or social reproductive sector. Because you might ask, so what happened to the right-wing parties? How do they enter this picture? And this is, I think, particularly interesting because, for instance, during the global economic crisis of 2007-2011, uh, I'm giving you an example from Italy. The Berlusconi government uh, in 2009 shut down new quotas for immigration. So it was no longer possible in Italy to enter as a legal migrant because um, Berlusconi presented this as a response to the economic crisis. So basically he was saying, 
we have an economic crisis uh, at the moment undergoing. We cannot have uh, new migrants coming because uh, we need to give jobs to Italians first. So we need to find, uh, uh, to, to, to find national supply for the jobs that we have. We cannot give jobs uh, to, to foreigners. But interestingly, on, uh, no, precisely on this occasion, the government did an amnesty uh, only for illegal migrants working as carers and domestic workers, since that was considered to be the only sector where the demand for labor could not be met by the national supply. And as you probably know, the majority of uh, um, elderly carers and domestic workers are women. So they did an amnesty. They decided to give visas only to migrant women. And on that occasion, the, the then leader of the Northern League, Roberto Maroni, he said, so in order to justify why they were actually legalizing migrant women, but they didn't want to legalize migrant men, he said, there cannot be a regularization for those who enter illegally, for those who rape a woman or rob a villa, but certainly we will take into account all those situations that have a strong social impact, as in the case of migrant caregivers. So right-wing immigration parties, such as the Northern League, were willing to close an eye to undocumented migrants when they are women working in the current domestic sector, even in times of crisis. This is very important to understand. This, uh, this, is, this didn't happen only in, in Italy. It happened also in Germany and partly also in the Netherlands. These parties can say, OK, um, maybe we can make an exception when it comes to migrant women. Maybe they are not so much the enemy because in the end they are doing these jobs that really help these European families, particularly in a moment in which these right-wing governments are increasingly cutting funds uh, for, for social welfare, for social benefits, for social care and so forth. So in a way these migrant women are particularly useful also for the voters of these right-wing right-wing parties in order to have cheap care labor. So uh, it is quite important, I think, to, uh, to realize uh, this type of association. Um, but this is not just about female nationalism and about uh, these, these parties. For instance, a few years ago, I carried out an analysis of, uh, um, on non-Western migrants' economic performance during uh, the, the, the economic uh, crisis. And what became particularly clear is that uh, all across Europe, uh, the sectors where migrant women are mostly employed, which is the socially reproductive sector, so caring, uh, uh, elderly care, child care, nursing, cleaning, uh, and, and all of these, uh, actually they were not affected by the crisis uh, so much as the, the sectors that tended to employ more uh, male migrant manpower, which is especially uh, construction and manufacture. So this is also uh, a powerful reminder of the ways in which uh, um, female nationalism at the moment as an ideology is operating according to a very neoliberal way of restructuring the economy, which is, uh, uh, which is, as I said, the ways in which manufacturing and construction can absorb the crisis and they can be shut down or can, they can be, for instance, uh, relocated in other countries. But the, ca the same cannot be done for social reproductive industries like elderly care, for example, especially in a context in which the population is aging. And there are many, many, many uh, older people, but not so much work and so much care for these people. So increasingly, migrant women are employed in this sector. So um, I think it's very important to acknowledge the connection between female nationalism and the neoliberal reorganization of social reproduction because the social reproductive sector uh, is the sector to which 
capital's crisis management tricks simply cannot be uh, easily applied. Because as I said, you cannot relocate elderly care, you cannot relocate childcare. You have to do it in loco, you have to, it has to be done and consumed uh, uh, at the same time in which the service is produced. Which means uh, that care work, socially productive work, must continue even in times of crisis. And I think this is a very important um, element to acknowledge when we acknowledge this type of powerful right-wing, supposedly feminist ideology. So in the, I think that, and I'm really going to my conclusion, for, sorry for being so long, this is just what I told you, it's just a graphic, a table showing some of these economic data on different sectors. But I think it's important to acknowledge how in the present context of Western European women's growing rates of uh, employment, it is increasingly Muslim and non-Western migrant women who are providing care for the children, the disabled and the elderly. This is occurring precisely at a historical moment in which Western Europe is both privatizing welfare and care services and confronted with an ever larger aging population. In other words, it is not by chance that civic integration programs encourage Muslim and non-Western migrant women to find jobs in the care and domestic sector or social reproduction. This is in fact a sector for which the demand is on the rise, particularly in a situation in which the population is aging, is aging fast, but European women do not want to do uh, to, to work as carers when they have other options. So the emphasis on non-Western migrant women overall as individuals to be helped in their integration and emancipation progress process, including through job offers, is possible because they, unlike male migrant workers, currently occupy a strategic role in the social reproductive sector of childcare, elderly care, and cleaning. Rather than jobs stealers, which is um, a, a, an epithet which is used very often for migrant men, those who steal jobs from the natives. So rather than job stealers, Muslim and non-Western migrant women are presented as those who allow Western European men and particularly women to work in the public sphere by providing that care that neoliberal restructuring has commodified. So in conclusion, and this is really my last slide, I just want to suggest that the double standard applied to Muslim and non-Western migrant women in the public imaginary as individuals in need of special attention and even rescue operates as an ideological tool that is strictly connected to their key role, present or future, in the reproduction of the material conditions of social reproduction. Female nationalism should be understood as part and parcel of the specifically neoliberal reorganization of welfare, labor, and state immigration policies that have occurred in the context of the global financial crisis, and more generally, the Western European crisis of social reproduction. So the very possibility that nationalists and neoliberals can exploit emancipatory ideals of gender equality as well as the convergence of feminist femocrats with anti-emancipatory xenophobic politics springs in large part from the specifically neoliberal reconfiguration of the Western European economy in the past 30 years. So I conclude here. Thanks a lot for the attention. So thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think even though your primarily focus is on um, Italy, France, Netherlands, uh, I think we can draw some similarities uh, here also. Maybe primarily t talking about violence uh, or cuts in uh, social services, or I think from Croatia, lots of women work as uh, migrant workers in Western Europe. So maybe we can take some questions from the audience now or uh, comments 
arguments, disagreements. Uh, hello, I'm a feminist and I want to thank you for this. Uh, so important to think uh, about your thesis. I would just want to uh, enlarge a little bit with uh, some um, realities. Uh, I come from Serbia and, um, and now in the last couple of years there are private um, agencies that uh, take women for three months in Germany to do this work with elderly and children, which is, and because they can, uh, Serbia is out of EU, EU, they can stay only three months and this is all done under la la la, and then they come back and then they, lots of my friends are doing this. Uh, second, um, uh, long time ago, uh, when it was Yugoslavia already, uh, uh, women from Slovenia were going to Italy via Trieste and doing the same thing. Three, um, uh, also in United States, Mexico women are long time ago doing the same care for elderly and for the children, etc., etc. So uh, I would just, I was just thinking um, that. Um, Maybe you can tell us also a little bit a wider picture, as you say, you know, that, that this, um, the, this same work that women are doing unpaid is now the, you know, I mean, what, what, is, what is fantastically what you are saying is that um, even in crisis and when, when it's not possible to do, these women, because of the work which is needed, can somehow pass all these borders and, and uh, trespass the, the rules and still do this work. So, but just to give us maybe some ideas about wider picture and Africa, Indian women going in different countries, you know, all, all those things. Yes, absolutely. Um, what, what, what you say is very true, because obviously um, female migration is not a new phenomenon, obviously, and uh, especially female migration for care labor is not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for, well, we can say at least in the ter in, in, since the beginning of capitalism, uh, conceived as care work in this way. So servants, uh, for instance, uh, were going from Ireland to, to England to work as servants, uh, maids, uh, and so forth. So it's a, it's a phenomenon that is a, a, as old as the history of capitalism, taking only this uh, um, historical period, I mean. Um, so maybe one of the things I want to say to what the, your reaction is, uh, what I am saying is not so much that uh, mm, these uh, ways in which right-wing uh, parties, for example, uh, can tolerate the presence of women, this does not mean that they are not racist uh, towards women. On the contrary, one of the things that I, I try to highlight in my book, that this is just a gendered form of racism. It's just, uh, if you want, a, 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 a more, it's a sexualized way in which racism uh, presents itself. Because I think one of the, for me at least, one of the most important uh, findings, uh, uh, not of my book, but for me, to, of my explorations into this world of female nationalism, one of the things that really opened my eyes was to read about uh, uh, the ways in which uh, uh, racism is very gendered and is uh, sexualized, but also uh, sexuality is racialized, which means that racism uh, operates differently for men and women. So to say that uh, women can be more assimilated because we need them as a social reproducers uh, does not mean that these uh, countries are more tolerant uh, towards women or that they you know, welcome them. On the contrary, it means that racism operates differently for them. So in that sense, yes, of course, we can legalize them, but then we reduce them to slavery in our households. They are overexploited, their work is paid nothing, they are humiliated, uh, and their work is considered unskilled, and so forth. This is obviously also a form of racism, and it operates differently because these are women. But there is also another way why racism is very 
sexualized and gendered. And it is precisely because um, one of the reasons why these right-wing nationalists think that women, in a way, um, can need to be integrated is precisely be is because they have a very racist idea of these women. It's because they think, because they are women, they don't have agency uh, as much as men. So they basically, they don't, dep they, they, they don't have their own ideas, their own personalities. Their personality and ideas depends on men. So we need to assimilate them we need to eradicate their national culture from their minds, basically, and we need to turn them into proper uh, West Western women. So there is a very strong uh, attempt at assimilation of these women. And also there is the idea they are more easily, as, uh, they can more easily be assimilated because they are women. And precisely because they're empty, they don't have agency, it is easier in a way to put, you know, just somehow to eradicate their culture and to uh, fill them in instead with another culture. And another important reason, I, th I, I am never tired of stressing this, is that the reason why these governments are so much obsessed with assimilating migrant women as Muslim women is because these are the mothers of the second generations. And so they want these women to educate their children according to the values of France, Italy, the Netherlands, and so forth. Because they think, of course, they have such an important role in children's education, and so we need to assimilate them in order for them to become good mothers. I don't know if you remember, but in 2005, 2006, in, there were the so-called Paris riots, and uh, in that period, uh, Sarkozy actually said uh, uh, the riots uh, happened especially in the banlieues, in the, uh, the, uh, you know, the periphery of, uh, of Paris. And uh, Sarkozy said, yeah, of course, these are the, the children of migrants uh, who are rioting. And the reason they are doing this is because they, they come from polygamic families. So they come basically for families that did not educate them in the French way. So this is just to say, um, all these elements are all very connected, but is it, I really want to stress, I'm not saying that uh, women are more tolerated, that there is less racism towards women. I'm saying that we need to understand the different ways in which racism is uh, uh, translated in the case of women. Thank you, Sarah, for a wonderful um, lecture. I'm a huge fan of the book, as you probably know. Um, I was just thinking about, about several topics, at least, but um, what I would like maybe to ask you to tell us something more about this process of feminization of migration. Um, I know the argument uh, from your book that the, the mainly the uh, population, the gender population in Global South uh, regarding the mi migration uh, workers, laborers, uh, is actually a women uh, labor's force. So uh, I'm thinking about how this changes this typical stereotype picture of, of Gastarbeiter, how not only men in migration but, but female workers. Um, Regarding to that, uh, this special stress on political economy of um, migration and uh, regarding the, the female uh, labor force, uh, it gives me something uh, else to think about, the structure of the family and how this also um, uh, have consequences in gender roles in the family. Because uh, once the, the crisis strike, it's not only that it deals with the sphere of production, but there is a crisis in sphere of reproduction. Not just that women are actually employed to help um, uh, uh, more stable families or something like that, but also in, uh, in, in terms that, that, that like uh, relationships uh, are changed. Uh, Deindustrialization, men without job, not uh, going to, I don't know, building uh, uh, constructions somewhere else in, in, in Europe or uh, 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 some, other, some other place, but women are actually covering the crisis. And just uh, uh, something completely else, um, do you think that your analysis of uh, these neoliberal policies and uh, the, the shift in, in and contradictions in feminism uh, 
is that possible to be applied also in terms of Swedish model uh, regarding the prostitution? Uh, some data are showing that, uh, again, when we are rescuing uh, the prostitutes, the sex workers, what are we uh, giving them by Swedish models is, again, the jobs of, of uh, uh, reproductive labor. Again, nurseries, uh, care laborers, and, and everything. I mean, this is like, again, a talk about precarious, very low wages, and everything else that, that you talked about and write about. Yeah, thank you very much. Th thanks a lot for these questions. I'll try to be brief. Um, also, I tend to talk too much otherwise. <laughs> no, they're, they're very important questions. So the Gastarbeiter, um, yeah, definitely, in a way, the, the image of the Gastarbeiter in Europe is very male. This idea of the, the young men from the south uh, um, going to work in manufacture is very challenged by the feminization of, of, of migration. And, you know, for those of, uh, who work on the history of migration in Europe, uh, it is especially uh, female migration that challenged uh, this uh, stereotype and idea of the gastarbeiter, because the gastarbeiter system, uh, when they shut down the system in Northern Europe uh, in, uh, in the early 1970s, it is actually in the 1970s that migrant women began to migrate. Not they didn't migrate before, obviously, but we see this migration en masse uh, after the 1970s. And there are many reasons for this. And one of the reasons is that all these supposedly guests, work, guest workers, they were not guests anymore. They decided to stay and to settle into these European countries, and they brought in their families. And so many women came for family reunification. But there is also another reason why the end of the gastarbeiter system coincides with female migration. And this is because in the 1970s, from the 1970s onwards, uh, uh, European women start to go to work en masse as well. And that means that all the work that they were doing for free in the families, it was not done by them anymore increasingly. And so there is a rising demand for this care labor within these families. So the image of the gastarbeiter and that of the female worker, are, you know, the histories are very intertwined. So it's a very interesting uh, history there. The, the ways in which the crisis affects gender relations, I know that there are increasingly studies now on this. Uh, one of the interesting things um, was that actually the global financial crisis, if you read uh, all the articles from the early 2000s, 2010s, um, they all say this is the he session and not the recession. So it is especially male workers who were losing jobs because manufacturing and construction were the sectors that were you know, most affected by the crisis. But they, they say the recession and the, the crisis was a male crisis, but austerity is a female phenomenon. So it is actually more recently that austerity policies um, are affecting women because austerity policies especially meant a cut to social services in which lots of women are employed or cut to state jobs and services that employ women. So more recently, I would say there has been a rebalance of the you know, gender way in which the crisis is absorbed, I would say. And finally, on sex workers, um, yeah, absolutely. There is work done on this. For instance, uh, Morgane Merteil in, uh, in France, she's done some work trying to uh, apply this idea of female nationalism to sex workers. And she demonstrates, as you say, that the, the, the idea of rescuing sex workers, emancipating them and taking them out of the street uh, also has meant for them, many of them to be relocated as exploited care workers, for example. So, uh, absolutely, there is certainly a connection here. Uh, thank you very much for your lovely lecture. Uh, I'm going to be short and sweet, and I would like to know what was the role of homonationalism and homonormativity in instrumentalizing uh, feminism? Because you mentioned that briefly in the beginning. Um, well,
Well, I, I think they are very related phenomena because um, they many. I think they are related, but they are not the same phenomenon. Because uh, s uh, this is one of the things I try to discuss in the book. And it is precisely that, uh, for instance, there are differences between uh, the right-wing parties that I analyze in the ways in which they instrumentalize uh, uh, gay and LGBTQ rights. So, for example, uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, Gert Wilders, who is uh, gay, um, and also other Dutch, right-wing Dutch politicians who were gay, gay men, they uh, obviously instrumentalize gay rights by saying gay rights belong to Western civilization and uh, Muslims do not respect gay rights, so they are enemies of our civilization. And so they use the gay rights and women's rights in very similar ways. But in Italy, for example, you don't see that because the Northern League is a very homophobic party and so they instrumentalize women's rights, but they don't do instrumentalize. They don't instrumentalize gay rights because, I mean, it, I guess it also depends on the context. Italy is a very homophobic country because of the presence of the Vatican. There is a different history when it comes to gay rights. France, the situation in France is more ambiguous because Marine Le Pen, the, the, first of all, the um, Front National, the National Front, traditionally is a very homophobic party. But Marine Le Pen, actually, in her attempt to modernize the, the Front National, she actually tried to be more ambiguous on gay rights. She was not open because she wanted to please the traditional homophobic voters, but at the same time, she wanted somehow to be a little bit open also to gay voters. And famously, her um, advisor, until a couple of years ago, was uh, an openly gay man. So there has been, and also in France, some uh, prominent gay men came out um, as Le Pen voters. So there is a different history in these countries, I would say, between homonationalism and femonationalism. There are correlations, but also differences. And the other thing I want to say is, uh, I don't think the political economy of homonationalism uh, operates in the same way. Um, I, I, I wouldn't tell you how it operates, I haven't done work on that. One of the, I, I wrote recently a little article which is called The Political Economy of Homonationalism, um, but it's actually, it raises questions, but it doesn't give many answers. And the, the reason is that uh, I think uh, one of the things I would have liked uh, Jasbir Puar to do is precisely to try to address more the political economic dimensions. I don't, know, I don't have the answer to that, uh, but I think that one productive way to look at the political economy of uh, homonationalism is to, to do what uh, Kevin Floyd did. Uh, Kevin Floyd is uh, um, an American queer theorist, and he wrote an important book on queer theory and Marxism. And in this book, basically, he says that uh, um, the images and representations of masculinity uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, they were very much linked to certain regimes of accumulation. For example, Fordism. So throughout Fordism, uh, when the main breadwinner was the man, there was a certain idea of masculinity as uh, the, precisely the man who goes to work in the morning, uh, is all, uh, has muscles, comes back, is strong, uh, brings food to the table, to the children, whereas the women are instead the ones staying at home, taking care of the children, cooking, etc. So there were certain images of femininity and masculinity linked to that mode uh, or, or produ of production or regime of accumulation, as some economists call it. And I think it would be interesting to look at the ways in which neoliberalism actually has completely changed this. So gender roles are very different under neoliberalism. Femininity and masculinity do not look like they did under Fordism, because women do many more jobs. They are not just staying home, but they also do men's jobs. Men do also women's jobs, and therefore, 
I actually think this is one way of looking at why neoliberalism is so keen on gay rights, precisely because the, the, uh, you know, the, the old for these gender roles are completely overturned by this new way of accumulation. I think this would be a useful way of looking into the political economy of homonationalism, but I don't know anyone who has done that, so. Okay, so thank you from my side also for this uh, interesting talk. Um, when I was listening to you, I thought that maybe um, what I missed in your analysis and in your talk regarding the um, uh, Western politics uh, are two terms, patriarchy and misogyny. Uh, you mentioned uh, those terms when you talked about in, in some other parts of your talk, but not when you are analyzing uh, Western politics. So, for example, when you answered the, the first question, you used the term sexualized racism, which is good, but I still think that we need to name things as they are, and I think that's, uh, that, that, that there's a connection between racism and misogyny in this in these cases. So uh, what I would also suggest in, is uh, when we talk about neoliberal uh, reorganization is to use the term uh, pat neoliberal patriarchy or patriarchal neoliberalism, but I think it's important because um, the patriarchy is the system which is creating and reproducing these hierarchies between uh, Western women and non-Western women. So I think that this, I miss that in, in that analysis. Um, and I also think that the patriarchy is the system which creates uh, this role that um, the, 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 the role for Muslim women in Western countries, but also the new role for European women in European countries. And uh, you mentioned the um, example from the video that women are in toplesses. So that's the, some kind of new role for the European women, and we have non-European women for other roles. So if you want to comment on that, how do you see uh, those things and these connections? Uh, yes, I, I hope I understood your question because I actually, throughout the, um, the book, I, I actually use uh, I, the word, the concept of misogyny and the word misogyny quite a lot because uh, Obviously, I try to explain how misogyny is precisely the accusation that uh, these uh, non-Western migrants, men, uh, you, they are accused of misogyny. They are accused of entrenched misogyny. And uh, Islam is uh, uh, defined as a misogynist, a patriarchal religion uh, par excellence. So it's uh, precisely the idea uh, this is what patriarchy looks like, is the exclusive domain of the Muslim order. So the idea is uh, precisely that uh, patriarchy uh, is not so much a problem in uh, the West anymore, but is a problem in non-Western societies, and especially within Muslim communities. So this is the, the type of uh, idea that uh, this book challenges. Um, especially in the, way, the ways in which this idea is uh, represented. So I don't want so much to enter into the discussion on what patriarchy is, because, I mean, that would be just a book in itself. And as you know, there have been many different ways in which the concept of patriarchy has been challenged by feminists in the last 20 years, also because of the ways in which it homogenizes different cultures, but also in the ways in which it doesn't name capitalism, as if uh, patriarchy before capitalism and after capitalism were the same thing. I don't think that's the case. I think certainly there has been uh, many forms of male domination throughout history, but we also need to understand the differences in different uh, historical periods. Um, 
so I, I, I don't think we need to enter into, into this now. But maybe the, the only thing I want to say is also, if maybe if I understand your question, in my book, I don't want to say that Muslim communities are not misogynist or that there is no misogyny within Islam or that certain Muslim men are not misogynist. Of course they are. Like, of course, uh, there is misogyny in all communities. And uh, there, you know, there are many men from different religions who are misogynist. I absolutely do refuse uh, the idea that Muslim men are more misogynist than Catholic men or uh, than uh, um, Anglican, Protestant, Buddhist men, and so on and so forth. This is uh, simply a, a, a mistake, a factual mistake, because uh, uh, it's absolutely not proven by any research and by any fact that these religions are more misogynist than others. Uh, I think there are historical, political, and economic reasons why Islam now is foregrounded as the absolutely patriarchal religion. But I don't think it's true. Just if you read the Bible and if you read the other religious texts, uh, you, uh, I mean, that there is no way in which we can say all religions are patriarchal and all religions are misogynist. So I don't think we should discount others at the expense uh, uh, of Islam. So I think it's important for me to say, of course, Muslims are also misogynist. Of course, there is patriarchy, but we should refuse the idea that there is something exceptional about them in this, because this is a general problem that belongs to our societies more generally, and it is not uh, the um, dominion of what one religion or one community or, uh, or, or one culture. I think this is very important to, to say. But there is also, if you allow me just uh, one minute, there is another thing I want to say, because uh, one of the things that I think it's important to rem remember, also I think this is a left-wing uh, audience, and um, this is a discussion I often have uh, with my also left-wing, uh, some of my left-wing uh, feminist friends in Italy. So sometimes, uh, you know, one of the things I try to say in the book also, maybe I didn't explain this very well today, is that the feminists who are against Islam are not just right-wing feminists. They are also many left-wing feminists. Like in Italy, for example, but also in France, uh, many of these women belong, uh, uh, you know, even in France to the Communist Party, in Italy to the Democratic Party, or even you know, to more left-wing um, uh, organizations. They write for left-wing journals like Il Manifesto, for example, in Italy, and still they are in favor of uh, banning the Muslim veil because they think the Muslim veil is a symbol of women's oppression. Now, um, one of the things they tell me, for example, is, uh, yes, okay, but how do you explain the fact that gender relations uh, are more advanced in the West and they are not so advanced, <coughs> excuse me, in Muslim and majority countries? And uh, one, of the things that I, one of the things I actually want to do in the future is precisely to challenge this idea is because it's a very powerful idea. When you say there are more, uh, women's rights are more advanced uh, in, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in France <coughs> than they are in Egypt uh, or uh, in some uh, Middle Eastern countries. Uh, this is, sometimes it is true, but we need to understand why it's true. Is it because in these countries uh, the majority of the population is Muslim or is it maybe because these countries have been colonized by Western countries? And colonialism, as we know, has profoundly changed also gender relations and laws, for instance, family laws in these countries. So one of the things I'd like also to suggest, I'm not the only one, there are also many other prominent um, feminists and uh, scholars doing this is precisely the ways in which colonialism itself uh, has profoundly um, overturned and, and challenged feminist movements in these Muslim countries, Muslim majority countries. So I think it's important to historicize all these categories, patriarchy, misogyny, uh, etc. So we're going to take another question here. 
it was a very interesting, it's a very interesting topic and a very good presentation. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, uh, if I just got the concept right, just like a quick question. So the way I take it, I haven't read your book yet, but the way I take it, you describe feminationalism actually as an ideology, not like an independent ideology, but something that is part of the neoliberal agenda, which actually has economic reasons behind it, but it is shaped in by Islamophobia and actually misogyny, if I got that right. And what I was going to ask actually is about future trends. Because if we see this as a trend that is happening now, uh, what do you think, I don't know, for example, the next 10 years are going to look like in the terms of female nationalism in Europe and which countries could be signaled as being the most problematic in this way? That is all. Yes, thank you. This is a very difficult question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I say that feminationalism is an ideology for two reasons, uh, I guess. One is that I was reacting against uh, this tendency to describe this phenomena as discourses, as if it's just rhetoric, um, and uh, as if it doesn't have actually material um, basis and, and material, you know, uh, concrete translations uh, in a way. Um, as I said, I think feminine nationalism is very institutionalized in different ways. And also, uh, the other reason, obviously, here I, I'm a little bit influenced by the way in which Althusser, for example, was trying to describe ideologies as materially and very strongly linked to the ways in which uh, the material conditions of production are reproduced on a daily basis. And the, the, he invited us to look at the materiality of ideologies. So I wanted to try to do that and to look uh, what, what there, there are any um, connections between the conditions of production and reproduction and this feminationalist ideology. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go much into this, but this is the only thing that I, I, I actually disagree with many things I'll to say I wrote about ideology, but I think this element here is quite important. And uh, I think it's important to keep the idea of the materiality of ideologies. So that said that, I guess this also is a way of answering your question and to say that uh, perhaps until these material conditions for the reproduction of female nationalism persist, which is to say the need for migrant and Muslim women to provide the supply labor for care labor uh, and for the, all the social reproductive labor, I would say that probably we will still see this female nationalist ideology as, uh, um, you know, continuing. And uh, the fact that right-wing parties across the, the world are rising also, unfortunately, and the ways in which they are using women's rights also, unfortunately, makes me think that this female nationalist ideology is going to stay here for quite some time and probably to grow stronger. Um, I guess, in a way, female nationalism is also an acknowledgement of the power, though, of the feminist movements in the past years, because one of the reasons why these right-wing parties, they claim to be in favor of women's rights is also because women's rights have become so important and so widespread that they also need to pay lip service to the idea of women's rights. It doesn't mean that they don't try to challenge women's rights in other ways, for instance, by attacking abortion, reproductive rights, and so forth, but at least on the facade, when it comes to migrant men, they need to say, oh, women's rights are very important. Um, well, this is a bit uh, co complicated because uh, now you are also making me think that uh, uh, even during, uh, you know, if fascism in Italy, the fascists were using this idea that it's important to defend uh, women against uh, a foreign men, against, uh, you know, brown and black men, uh, because they were considered to be the enemy. And this, and I guess, uh, this is a long story again. I talk a little, not a little bit, I talk a lot about that in the book, which is the connection between feminism and nationalism 
and how we need to understand the importance of women for nationalism, for the nationalist project. But yeah, I, I, my feeling is that female nationalism is going to stay for some time and to grow, unfortunately. Thank you. And maybe if I could just have one replica and then I won't be boring because I talk a lot too. <laughs> uh, so if there is an economic need for this kind of labor and you say that in part this kind of need is caused by the decline of social services. So technically a strategy of lessening that need would, to be, would be to enhance the social services of the state because uh, the women who come to work, migrant women who come to work in these conditions, they are employed not in the public sector, right? But in the private or do it, did I get that? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's it. I don't have anything else to comment, but thank you. So I think our time is up. And I would like to thank you for a great lecture and uh, inspiring discussion. Thank you all for participating. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>